Good morning, everyone, everywhere, and welcome to Worship with Homer United Methodist Church. Today, friends from around Alaska and around the country join us in worship, and we are so glad that we can praise God together today. To prepare your hearts and minds for worship, I encourage you to pull up your worship guide, which was sent out in Saturday's newsletter and is linked down on Facebook below so that you can follow along with the liturgy. I also encourage you to get out a candle and light it as a reminder of the light of Christ that connects each one of us. And I invite you to take a moment to breathe deeply and remember that you are standing on holy ground. As we prepare our hearts and our spaces for worship, let us be blessed by the music of Venika Marimba. storms and shipwrecks of our lives remind us that we are not alone. Open our eyes and our hearts to your presence with us and to the people in our midst who are hungry for your healing love. Make us instruments of your peace and love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God is disruptive. Time and again, we see how God disrupts people's lives and expectations, forcing them to look at themselves and their neighbors and their faith in all new ways. Let's listen to today's scripture and hear again about God's disruptive power. A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After we reached safety, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native showed us unusual kindness. Since it had begun to rain and was cold, they kindled a fire and welcomed all of us around it. Paul had gathered a bundle of brushwood and was putting it on the fire when a viper 
driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, This man must be a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were expecting him to swell up or drop dead. But after they had waited a long time and saw that nothing unusual had happened to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It so happened that the father of Publius lay sick in bed with fever and dysentery. Paul visited him and cured him by praying and put his hands on him. After this happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They bestowed many honors on us, and when we were about to sail, they put on board all the provisions we needed. Words of God, words of life. Thanks be to God. Good morning, my friends in Homer, Girdwood, Wasilla, and all around the state and the country. I wanted to show you today one of my favorite places. This is the Seafarer's Memorial on the Homer Spit in Kachemak Bay. This memorial was the dream of a local fisherman, Drew Scalzi, who wanted to commemorate all of those who gave their livelihoods and lives to the sea. The bricks surrounding the memorial hold the names of the people, the families, and the vessels lost at sea. And unfortunately, the number of bricks increase each year. These names come from the loss of a variety of different kinds of vessels, from mailboats to kayaks, skiffs and canoes, to commercial fishing boats, and even spotting aircraft for the herring fisheries. Locals and visitors come here to the memorial to remember their loved ones and to honor all of those seafarers who risk their lives on the ocean. Next to the memorial, on a pedestal, there's a plaque with a poem written by Ryan Bundy. The sea tells a story. It tells of the life it brings and the lives it claims. Its deep, dark waters are home to some, a final resting place to others. The sea tells a story. It tells of the cycle of life running through its waters, fish spawning, dying, sinking to the ocean floor, returning to the circle that engulfs all life. The sea tells a story. It tells of prosperity, yet how that prosperity can be unforgiving. Nearly everyone will experience its vastness, but some will remain there forever. Here in Homer, we know the risk of going to sea. We know the risk and rewards of commercial and recreational fishing and boating. And we have this monument, the Seafarer's Memorial, which is a tribute to the living and the lost and a reminder to all of us to respect the power 
of the sea. Our scripture today begins with survivors being washed up on the shores of a strange island. They're survivors of a shipwreck, and among them is the Apostle Paul. Let's go inside out of the wind and talk about how Paul got to those strange shores. God is disruptive. We have seen that time and time again throughout this series. God disrupted the disciples and the crowd on Pentecost. God disrupted Philip and the eunuch from Ethiopia on their journeys and bound them together through baptism. And then last week we heard from Pastor Nico how God disrupted Paul's expectations on a riverbank when he found a surprising person leading a worship gathering there, a woman named Lydia. God is disruptive. And today we're going to see the way that God once again disrupted Paul's life. Now, we've jumped ahead a bit from our scripture last week. Now we're almost at the end of the book of Acts. Paul has been arrested. He's already been brought before the Jewish authorities, then the governor, and then the king. And because he's a Roman citizen, he has, appeared, he has appealed now to appear before the emperor which means he has to be taken to Rome. Now, Paul was a prisoner, and so he had to be transported to Rome by ship. They started in Caesarea, Caesarea to Sidon, Sidon to Myra, Myra to Nidus, then on to Fair Havens on Crete, and then to Sicily, and up the coast of Italy to Terracina, where they would go overland to Rome. At least that was the initial plan. If any of you have ever flown around Southeast Alaska, the number of stops on that trip sounds familiar because this was basically their version of the milk run. They were stopping in all these ports along the way because they were trading ships, not passenger ships. They were cargo ships and prisoners were just another form of cargo. And that meant that profit played a big part in the captain's decision-making process, as we'll see later. Those ancient sailors knew about the dangers of the sea, and they knew that the fall and winter were the deadliest times to sail, so they wanted to find a port where they could stay all winter. But there were problems with this trip from the start. Maybe they did leave too late in the season, or maybe there were strange weather patterns from the beginning. We just don't know. But from the very start of the trip, Paul reports that the wind was constantly against them, and sailing was difficult, if not dangerous, right from the start. The safe season was drawing to a close. The author of Acts reports in chapter 27 that the fast had already passed. The holy day of Yom Kippur was already gone, which meant it was in the autumn and they were about to sail straight into the winter storms. So they stopped at a port on Crete called Fair Havens, but it just wasn't a suitable place to spend the winter. So the captain decided to head around the island to another port on Crete called Phoenix, where there was a good harbor where they could anchor all winter. Paul advised against this, but why listen to a prophet when you're more concerned about prophets? The captain decided that he wanted to head out. They had planned to hug the shoreline for the short trip, but instead a gale force wind from the northeast caught them and they couldn't sail into the storm, so they turned and tried to make a run for it. But the storm kept pounding them. They tried to throw out the sea anchor, but that didn't help. Then they started throwing cargo overboard and that didn't help either. They threw the ship's tackle overboard and still that didn't help. Paul says, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest raged, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. In the midst of this storm, Paul has a dream or a vision in which an angel of the Lord tells him that he and everyone else on board is going to survive this storm. The ship is going to be lost, but the people will survive. Just when they were about to give in to despair, Paul speaks a word of hope to them directly from God. We will get through this. They all break bread together one more time, 
And then in one last ditch effort to lighten their load, they throw the last of their food supplies overboard to lighten the ship as much as possible. They had spotted an island and they were gonna try to run aground. And unfortunately, as they headed to that island, they hit a reef and the bow got stuck. And meanwhile, the storm surge was pounding them from behind, breaking up the stern of the ship. Everybody who could swim jumped overboard and those who couldn't grabbed whatever plank or board was floating by and let the waves take them in. And they all made it to shore. And when the inhabitants of the island found the shipwrecked sailors, they found out that they had washed up on the island of Malta. Now let's put this distance into perspective. So at the beginning of this sermon, I showed you a clip from the Seafarer's Memorial and as I was reading the poem, you could see off in the distance the point of land on the far side of Kachemak Bay, which is Point Poughkeepsie. That was only 20 miles away. If it had been a little bit clearer out, you could have seen the triangular island of St. Augustine, which is one of the active volcanoes in the area. Augustine is 70 miles away from Homer. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the distances that we're talking. Remember I said that Paul's captain had planned on sailing from Fair Havens on Crete to Phoenix, another port on Crete. Those places are only about 40 nautical miles apart. So think about it, if we start sailing from Homer and we head out around the bluff and up Cook Inlet for 40 nautical miles, do you know where we would be? Nanilchik. It's not that far away. But where did they end up? Malta, which was 460 nautical miles from where they started. If we started out from here in Homer and set sail for 460 nautical miles, we'd be most of the way to Unalaska. This storm was huge and it disrupted all their plans. But then God disrupted the disruption. It seemed like that storm had changed everything. It almost killed them. It smashed their ship to bits. They ended up on a strange island. Paul even got bitten by a snake. But God is there in the midst of all of it. God had sent Paul on a mission and nothing was going to change it. Not storms, not shipwrecks, not snake bites. God had a job for Paul to do, to spread the gospel wherever he was. God was not going to let a little disruption like a shipwreck ruin those plans. So God disrupts the disruption. God is there with Paul healing and blessing and serving and feeding. This may have not been the place that Paul thought he was going but God put him to work right where he was. God's redemptive power does not depend on everything going according to our plans. God's redemptive power does not depend on calm seas and smooth sailing. In the midst of the disruptions of life, of winds and storms and shipwrecks that disrupt our carefully laid plans, God is there disrupting the disruptions working goodness and blessings in the midst of the mess. Look at how God empowered Paul after he washed up on that shore. Do you remember the first thing Paul did? He helped gather firewood. He saw what the locals were doing and he jumped in to help. Then he met the leader whose father was sick and Paul visited him and healed him. And once God's healing power became known, people from all over the island came to be cured and cared for. The storm threw Paul off course, but God was right there with him, leading him and guiding him, empowering him to be fully present and faithful right where he was. How about you? Does your life seem a little off course right now? <laughs> I bet it does. Marches and demonstrations and protests and the pandemic, all of it has disrupted our normal way of life, our plans. But how is God disrupting the disruptions? How is God using you 
right here and right now? How has God put you to work right now in the midst of the disruptions? This week, I want you to reflect on how God is working within this grand disruptive period in our lives for redemption and healing. Think about where you're seeing old wounds that have been festering for far too long, torn open and exposed to the fresh air and light of day. Think about the invitation that you've received from God to use some of this time of isolation and solitude to reflect on your own spiritual practices. Look at the people around you that you are shipwrecked with, your family, your housemates, your immediate neighbors and community. How can you continue to cultivate patience and tolerance with those that live closest to you right now? How can you pull together with your community to make your own town safer for everyone? Paul thought that he was going to Rome and he did get there eventually. <laughs> But God didn't abandon him on his detour. Instead, God helped him look at the people right in front of him and showed him how he could serve them and witness to his love of Christ. When your own life feels wrecked by circumstances outside of your control, know that in the midst of the disruption, God is there bringing healing and wholeness to you and through you. I want to leave you today with this blessing from the early Scottish church. Deep peace of the running waves to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. And deep peace of the Prince of Peace to you, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for coming with me on our field trip today. As we enter into our time of prayer together, I invite you to Either write in the comments those concerns that are on your heart today. You can email them to me at the email address you see on the screen, or you can raise them up in your heart and mind, knowing that God hears our prayers that are too deep to even formulate into words. As I lift up these different categories of people and situations to pray for, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond hear our prayer. Let us pray together. Let us pray for all of those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who feel lonely or abandoned in isolation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all of those who are physically ill, particularly those who are suffering from COVID-19 and their families, friends, and communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all of the caregivers, the healthcare professionals, the doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, and hospital staff who care for everyone in their time of need and for those caregivers at home who give of themselves for the comfort of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all of those who are struggling right now, those who are struggling with finances, those who are struggling with family, those who are struggling with fear.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all of those who grieve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who suffer from the sin and injustice of racism. And let us pray for all of those who wittingly or not perpetuate systems of white supremacy. Open our eyes, God, that we may see and do better. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At this time, Lord, in which we must continue to stay home and stay the course, we ask that you are with us, risen Savior, reminding us that we are never alone. In your name we pray. Amen. Please pray with me the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For nine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for your continued generosity during this time. It is because of your tithes and offerings that we are able to continue our missions and ministries in this community and around the state and the world. I'm particularly grateful this week for the work of the trustees who found a small problem in the building and took care of it as soon as possible. It's because they give selflessly of their time that we are able to gather online and know that our building is still safe and secure and in great working order so that the food pantry can continue to serve the community. I appreciate the generosity that so many of you show, giving your time, your talents, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Thank you so much. If you would like to make a monetary donation to the church, you can visit our website, which is linked down below, and find our donation portal there, or you're welcome to send a check to the street address that you see on the screen. Because of you, we are all able to continue to be the hands and feet of Christ as members of his body, the church, wherever it is that we are. Thank you. For the last time, I leave you with this benediction for our series. And as we go forth today, I invite you to continually keep your eyes open for the ways that God is being disrupted in the world around you and in your own life. And I invite you to receive this benediction for what it is, both a blessing and a challenge. Grant us, Lord God, a vision of your world as your love would have it. A world where the weak are protected and none go hungry or poor. A world where the riches of creation are shared and everyone can enjoy them. A world where different races and cultures can live in harmony and mutual respect. A world where peace is built with justice and justice is guided by love. Give us the inspiration and the courage to build it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.